can the new Webb telescope look at Dragonfly 44 and see it more clearly? Yes, we're all very excited about the James Webb Telescope, which will launch in 2018. It's a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's going to be an astonishing machine. We are planning to propose to look at Dragonfly 44 and perhaps other galaxies like it, because it will provide a much clearer view of this galaxy. It will also be able to measure the amount of dark matter much further away from where we've measured it so far, so we can get a much better measurement of how much dark matter there is and also of the nature of the stars in this galaxy when they formed and hopefully learn how these galaxies came to be. So the James Webb Space Telescope will change and revolutionize a lot of fields of astronomy. And for us, it comes at a great time because we're finding these galaxies that really push our current telescopes to the limits. Does it mean that when the Webb Telescope launches in 2018, that there might even be a computer network between the Webb, the Dragonfly, Keck, Hubble, so that all of the telescopes could talk to each other? Yeah, and some of that actually already exists because sometimes there's an explosion in the sky that's a supernova explosion or a gamma ray burst explosion. And then the key is to very quickly point as many telescopes at that location in the sky as possible. As soon as a supernova is detected, it sends a signal to a bunch of telescopes, and they will, sometimes within seconds, move to that position and start taking images without a human ever being in the middle. Wow. Yeah, it is, it is really astonishing what can be done these days. And who is the traffic cop amid the telescopes? In other words, how do the telescopes talk to each other? Well, that's a very good question. It is tricky to figure those things out. Particularly, a telescope might be doing something for researcher A, and then all of a sudden there's this uh, supernova goes off, and researcher B says, stop what you're doing, telescope, move to my supernova. And so this is where these committees come in, time allocation committees, who try to make judgment calls on what things should get priority. So you try to anticipate what might happen, and then there's rules that govern who gets priority if something happens that requires one of these interrupts. It's tricky because there's often competing teams that want to do the same thing. In our case, we don't have to worry about that because it's our telescope and we have 100% of time on it. Are the committees around the world in both hemispheres or only in the United States, or how does that work? Well, telescopes have their own committees, like the Keck telescopes have a committee, European telescopes have their committee, and it's usually who owns and operates the telescope gets to decide. The U.S. operates a bunch of telescopes. The U.S. committee decides on these things. But some international telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, it's an international committee, and it meets in Baltimore in the United States every year. But there's a lot of people from Europe and from South America and China, Japan, who fly into Baltimore and participate in these meetings to decide what should be observed. So if something were coming into our solar system, let's say some large rogue asteroid that we hadn't known before, and maybe it's six miles in diameter, an extinction event, is that the kind of thing where the telescope network would send out an urgent request for all telescopes around the world to look at it? Yeah, although in in that particular case, I think we'd all be hiding under our desk and hoping for the best. But... um, (laughs) Yeah. More generally, if something truly exciting happens, ultimately the directors of these telescopes have authority to stop whatever the telescope is doing and change the program. Is it true that if a star explodes with a tremendous amount of gamma ray energy, that it could wipe out all surface life on Earth, depending upon the distance? Well, I don't want to alarm your listeners, but yes, (laughs) it could do that. There's this class of explosions called gamma ray bursts, and they're extremely energetic. Some people even have linked past extinction events on Earth to gamma ray burst events. If a gamma ray burst went off close to the Earth, it would not be a good day. What would determine whether a star exploded with a tremendous gamma ray burst or not? Oh, it's not well known, but we do know that the star has to be very massive 
before it can produce the gamma ray burst. It has to explode in what's called a supernova. What we didn't know is that some of these supernova are accompanied by this enormous burst of gamma rays, incredibly energetic particles on Earth in nuclear explosions, extremely harmful rays that can obliterate life. It's not that well understood why some stars do this, some stars don't. What is the closest star that might burst that's large and could emit a lot of gamma rays? That's an interesting question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is Eta Carina, which is one of the most massive stars in our galaxy, and it's also nearing the end of its life. In addition to Dragonfly 44, is there anything else that you have discovered that you are excited about as another huge mystery? Well, one thing is that galaxies continuously grow by eating other galaxies. They have quite an appetite, and any galaxy in the universe has either recently eaten a small other galaxy or it will do so soon. So galaxies are cannibals. They eat each other. And the question is how much do they eat? What did they eat recently? What will they eat in the future? And how much will they grow through this process? The answer is quite a lot. And they all look completely different. One has eaten a lot. Another has been on a starvation diet and has not eaten anything in a long time. One thing that we're trying to understand is what determines the eating habits of a galaxy and how does that change over time. What is the Milky Way galaxy eating? The Milky Way has quite an appetite. It is currently eating a galaxy called Sagittarius Dwarf that's in the process of being disrupted and merging with the Milky Way. And the next logical step is we have to be finding other life in this universe. It's preposterous that a 13.9 billion light-year universe that Earth in the backwater of the Milky Way galaxy would be the only planet with intelligent humanoids? Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, we have, of course, discovered a lot of planets around other stars, and Proxima B, this latest incredible discovery of a potentially Earth-like planet in the habitable zone around Earth, near a star. So one big uncertainty in that whole question has been resolved the question, how rare is it to have planets, and particularly planets like Earth? Not rare at all. Many, many stars have them. There's a huge diversity of solar systems in our galaxy. And so that is an incredibly exciting result, because it means that there certainly is a lot of potential for life to develop. There's a lot of locations where that could have happened. Like Michio Kaku argues, that We are on a 4.6 billion-year-old Earth and solar system, so we would be in the one-third most recent part of the universe with two-thirds of the universe older than we are. Yeah, of course. But what is unknown in that argument is how likely it is for life to develop in the first place. That's the big question that we don't have an answer to. I think the empirical scientific approach of looking and trying to find as many planets as we can, and then study those planets, look for biosignatures. We want to find out how many Earth-like planets there are, how many of them have an atmosphere that looks somewhat like Earth, and particularly with oxygen. And then the next steps are to survey those planets in greater detail and to understand more of their chemistry and see if there's any direct evidence for things that we have on Earth, like plants. And I think it's a very fruitful approach. They'll get us closer perhaps not directly in contact with aliens, but it will answer the next set of questions. And and it's exciting that we have those. If we hadn't discovered all those planets around other stars, we'd be done at this point. There would be nothing else to search for, but there is, and that's exciting. I talked to an astronomer once who had a hypothesis that if we knew the truth, that this universe was only one of maybe a group say that there are 10 universes and that each universe had some sort of an electromagnetic membrane separating it from its group, we might have a twin universe where everything was the opposite of this universe. The influence of other universes that we do not detect could be the explanation for things like multiverses, other dimensions, dark matter, and dark energy. 
Yeah, it is fascinating. And that idea, I think, has been put forward mostly to try to explain the existence of the dark energy, which is in some sense even more strange than the dark matter, because the dark energy you can see is an anti-gravity that pushes everything apart and speeds up the universe rather than the dark matter, which at least knows how to behave in terms of its gravity. It has a positive gravity, attractive force. It doesn't cause the expansion of the universe to speed up. Yeah, I think most people believe that the universe is just one of a huge number of universes. They might interact in some way. The number of dimensions could be different in different universes. The laws of physics could be different. Our universe could be sort of an accidental one where we wonder greatly about why there is this amount of dark matter. It's one universe over, everything could be slightly different. I think most astronomers would say there's probably many, many universes, also many different realities within this universe.